The two-year anniversary since my heroic return is near, so I decided to revisit my older videos in an attempt to expand on them whenever possible. The oldest is the Dragon Ball overview, so I can mention its 10 biggest problems. It's not gonna be about the plot holes, since that would take months to go over, and it doesn't matter since we all know that nobody's watching the show because it makes sense. It's gonna be a more generalized list of stuff I have already talked about in my truth videos. And whenever possible, I will try to include when said problem became prominent in later fighting shonen as well. Because it's no secret that the success of Dragon Ball often pushes mangaka to copy its formula without necessarily fixing the various problems it had. The first problem is the shafting of characters. It's something that happens in all shonen. They constantly have to introduce more and more characters just to keep things fresh, and after a while they don't do anything with them. Most become background decorations, which feels lazy on behalf of the scriptwriter. The best characters in any shonen are those who manage to stay relevant in multiple arcs, not those who become spectators. Many try to defend this by saying it's impossible for every character to remain relevant, and that it makes sense for someone who served his purpose to be removed from the spotlight. I say this is a cheap excuse used by lazy people. A character becomes irrelevant only when the scriptwriter doesn't know what to do with him after his initial purpose is achieved. Yamcha became irrelevant after the first arc because Toriyama couldn't think of something to do with him in later arcs. Lunch disappears entirely because of how little thought was put into her creation. Piccolo didn't become irrelevant after he got defeated twice because Toriyama made him the mentor of Gohan. Bulma remained relevant because she was always the smart character that everyone relied on for her creations. So as you see, there are no excuses other than laziness on part of the scriptwriter. The lesson here is, don't yamcha your characters. Instead of introducing more and more soon-to-be relevant characters, keep developing the few ones you had at first. The second problem is the training sessions. Most people find them very boring. They take up a lot of time, and often the only thing that matters is whatever power-up the characters get at the end. It's true that training sessions are a waste of time on their own, and why you should never have just training. You need to flavor it with something else going on at the same time. The training with Kame Senin trying to remain interesting with comedy and fan service, which is better than nothing, but far from enough if it has to stay interesting across several episodes. The right approach is a later training session, the one from the Saiyan Saga. That was close to perfect, because we were constantly seeing what everybody else was doing at the same time. There were far more things going on plot-wise than just training. What you must not do with training sessions is rush past them or completely ignore them. They do not function just for giving power-ups to the characters. They are also there for making it clear how getting the power-up is hard, because it takes a lot of time and effort. They can also be used to provide some insight to the characters, which did wonders for Piccolo. Rushing or skipping them entirely makes it seem like the power-up was very easy, and it doesn't mean something for the characters other than getting it, which is one of the main reasons for why everything became so cheap after the Saiyan Saga. The characters were getting Zenkai boosts that didn't need any training, or were it training out of screen. Fast forward to the Tournament of Power, and everyone becomes super powerful just by scratching his back. It became a joke and nobody was laughing. The third problem is the, the tournament, tournament arcs! They are fine for stopping the plot, introducing characters, and for giving them the spotlight when it's just a duel where nobody else can intervene. When the duel is over, though, time resumes normally and everyone can intervene. You get a situation where most of these characters get shafted because they are worthless when they don't have the spotlight. They are either too weak or don't have any usefulness when they are part of a large team. So essentially, this is an extension of the shafting problem. When the scriptwriter can only write a character in vacuum, and not how he will interact with everybody else once the tournament is over, and time no longer freezes, you get tension Han after the second martial arts competition, or the Naruto cast after the tune-in exam. If you rely on tournaments for introducing or fleshing them out, you are left with very little once they are over. So don't use tournaments, and instead have the characters being important as part of a team, and not only when they are in a duel where nobody else can intervene. During the Red Ribbon Army, we get the fourth problem of focusing too much on the main characters. It's another variation of the shafting problem, only this one happens from the other side of the spectrum. The support cast might be able to somehow contribute, but we don't see it because we only follow the main characters, and they get to do everything. It doesn't sound like a problem, since why would you expect anyone else who is not the main character to get that much attention? Well, that's the thing. If you're introduced to a character with a name, a backdrop, and personal goals, why would you not expect him to be important to the plot? 
Goku was always the protagonist, but during the first arc, everyone had something to contribute to the story. During the Red Ribbon arc, it was only Goku who was doing everything. Not just because everybody else had nothing to offer, but because the scriptwriter was being lazy. The same thing that happens to so many other characters in so many other shows. We hardly see the fellow students of Naruto or the other pirate crews in One Piece. Which is why the best shonen of them all is Full Metal Alchemist. Almost everybody does something all the time, all the way to the end. The fifth problem which begins with Tao Pai Pai is the over-reliance on power-ups. Having boring training sessions that lead to a power-up is one thing, but constantly needing power-ups as the only way to fix a problem is another. It's when the only way for a villain to pose a threat is him being stronger than the hero, and the only way for the hero to beat him is to get stronger than him. If that is the only way you can think of for maintaining tension, then this becomes the whole plot. Personalities don't matter, ideologies don't matter, not to mention how you are inviting power creep to ruin everything. Also, it becomes so repetitive, it begins to skip essential steps to getting the power up, such as not showing the training and getting stronger by scratching your back. A way to fix this is to have ways for beating a villain without resorting to raw power. You can defeat him ideologically or mentally, or even to ruin his image in the eyes of the people. There are many different ways and they are all far more indirect and far more interesting than punching him to submission. The sixth problem which begins with Senzu beans and the Dragon Balls is treating injuries and death as minor inconveniences. Instead of making it harder to recover from a battle, you just throw in a way for instant healing. Instead of removing dead characters from the plot, you keep resurrecting them back to full health with no problem. Yeah, sure, I know why they do it. It's because the writer can afford to have a character spending years in recovery, and he won't be able to sell toys out of dead characters you never get to see again. But as far as storytelling goes, if you cheapen injuries and death so much, then there is no tension. Why would anyone worry when there are easy ways for fixing any sort of negative consequences? I personally think that injuries are a great way for cycling around the character or roster. One good guy may win in a fight, but he gets very injured and needs another good guy to be the main character in the next arc. Dragon Ball sort of does that, since there are many cases when Goku is healing or dead and the others need to deal with the bad guys. But they never win by themselves. Besides that exception with Gohan vs. Cell, they are just stalling until Goku comes back to save the day. Because he can, he has the means. And he steals all the spotlight because of it. Nobody else gets to shine because of this issue, and we go back to the same shafting problem. The Saiyan Saga introduces the seventh problem of the power levels. Many fighting shonen use simplistic and limiting power systems that are based on numbers for ranking the fighters from weakest to strongest. It's a very dumb way for having a hierarchy, especially when the numbers mean nothing when they fluctuate like crazy. If a number is all it takes for knowing which one is going to win, it makes the battle predictable. If the numbers can go up and down from willpower or sudden power-ups, then they lose their importance. And needless to say, the power creep quickly makes them irrelevant since they get ridiculously high and they eventually have no practical value besides being a number that keeps going up. If you can somehow show how strong someone is, then there is no point to use numbers. Tactics and techniques are not measured with numbers anyways, since they work better or worse, depending on the circumstances. A direct result of spectacle creep and meaningless numbers that keep going up without meaning something leads to the unavoidable eighth problem of nerfing. It's when abilities become so powerful, the scriptwriter has to ignore how they actually work or to lessen their capabilities in the next arc so the battles can still be challenging. It's also what happens when the mangaka can think of a way to change the structure of the battles because of the recent power-up, so he just dumps down everything in order to keep them playing out the same way, even if that means a fighter is now a weakling when just a few episodes ago he could blow up entire continents. It's what happens once the show reached the Namek saga. The fight choreography became repetitive thereon, and the power-ups were rendered meaningless, since nothing actually changes in the way the fights play out, no matter how many power-ups someone gets. It's much better to just have limitations and backlashes in every new power-up that can render it useless if the circumstances are not right. This way you can avoid the need to constantly nerf them. So imagine how bad it was when, problem number 9. Dragon Ball not only didn't add limitations and weaknesses, it went as far as removing the pre-existing ones. 
The weakness of a Saiyan tail? Gone. The limitation of resurrecting someone once? Gone. Using them a fubo at the cost of your life? Gone. The simple things that would have kept any battle interesting, since there would always be a way for something to backfire, no matter how strong a character is, were now removed entirely. Instead of balancing out every new power-up with an extra limitation, which in turn would make the fights more elaborate, since there would be more and more things to take into consideration, Toriyama fucked it up and removed everything! All you were left with was two guys punching each other. Of course it was becoming more boring every time that happened, in the same way the already boring fights of My Hero Academia became even more boring once everyone kept getting power-ups that didn't have limitations anymore, which was a big selling point, I must remind you. And this brings us to the final problem, which became prevalent in Dragon Ball Super. With no limitations, an easy way to negate consequences, and the main character being ridiculously strong just because his numbers kept going up, there was no way for a new threat to feel challenging anymore. So Toriyama had to create fake tension by making Goku even more stupid than he was already, so he won't be winning in a fraction of a second all the time. I lost track of how many times he was not doing the obvious because he kept forgetting what he was capable of or are letting his guard down and losing like a total noob despite having 40 years of constantly learning in every battle and being able to blow up entire galaxies by sneezing. Watching the main character becoming dumber and dumber instead of the other way around was unbearable. It was character regression for the sake of fake stakes. The more the power levels kept going up, the more his intelligence kept going down and the more insulting it was becoming to the viewer's intelligence. And those were the 10 problematic elements that most shonen copy to this day when they are trying to be Dragon Ball clones. Now you have a quality meter that can be used for scoring any arc of any fighting shonen depending on how many of these problems it avoids.